Well, Mike, I really appreciate you taking time out from your busy schedule. You have so many things going in your life, and your professional career is just zooming, and so I feel really lucky to get you for a while to talk a little bit about one of your favorite topics, that is storytelling, and especially how it relates to television and to movies. Um, and as we begin to talk about that, I, I think it's uh, helpful to, to go back to the way story really functions uh, for us. Story is a way, really, that we have of ordering and unifying our experience, trying to get some uh, meaning out of an often chaotic thing. We often talk about the fact that by our very lives and our decisions, we author a story. And we not only author it, but then we have to read that story, and at times we try to tell other people about our story. And there's a way in which I think stories then disclose the possibilities of life. So if you tell me your story about uh, how you came to be interested in storytelling and popular culture, then I probably learned something about its value. In fact, let's experiment with that. <laughs> how, how about telling me how you came, what's the story of how you came to be interested in popular culture or in the storytelling form? Well, I think that uh, I'm not sure I really know the answer to that when it actually occurred. I do know that that I became uh, it became clear to me in the middle beginning of my career as a as a faculty member when I was first teaching in Minnesota that the traditional views of literature were short sighted because they didn't include enough of culture. I became particularly affected by television and film because I realized that these were powerful storytelling methods um, and no one was attending to them at that point in my career. Film scholarship was just beginning, and television scholarship was non-existent, uh, literally. Um, and I, f I became aware that people were being moved, uh, being, uh, being affected by these, these powerful storytelling forms, and no one was critically attending to how they worked and what kinds of things occurred and, and, and how it was that people could tell a story through these, through these mass media. Um, I also began to be interested in popular writers, and uh, I think for a very pragmatic reason, actually, and that is a, one of the it, real advantages of dealing with a popular writer, particularly a live one, is you can talk to them, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you can find out about the process that they mm -hmm. go through, and what it is that, that drives them, and, and how they function, and, and um, how they work, and uh, what influences them, and how they interact with that whole world. Uh, one way in which this came to 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 real fruition for me, uh, I'd always been interested in this, but in 1985, um, a professional colleague of mine from another university and I went to Hollywood. And we spent a week interviewing all the people who were associated with the production of the Gunsmoke television series over a 20-year period. That is, producers, writers, directors, mm -hmm. actors. It was an incredible experience. This is the, the series Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke, which was on from 19, well, on, I think its last season was 1975. From 1955 to 1975, it was the longest running dramatic program on television. What I learned from that experience, that week in Hollywood, was that all of these people who contributed to that program were part of a storytelling community. It became perfectly clear to me how this worked finally. And that is that they didn't work in isolation. The the script writers, for example, had lunch together every week, and they said, well, here's the story I'm working on, here's the one I'm working on. They became a metaphor for what we know about storytelling. My story is going to affect your story, and your story is going to affect my story. They actually worked out in their professional lives what most of us know now to be the way in which storytelling works. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a communal process. It's something that we do collectively. Mm -hmm. So... The reason that films and television programs and so on are so intriguing to me is because they are a living embodiment of the communal storytelling process. Mm -hmm. No one person does a film, despite the auteurists, the people who want to say that the, the, the film director as, 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 as superstar. That's nonsense. I mean, there's hundreds of people who influence that product, not just mm -hmm. one. So every film, now there are some that are more, more of an auteur, more of an artist than others. I mean, a Woody Allen does everything himself. Uh -huh. you know, but. Uh, but by and large, filmmakers are parts of a community. They're, they're party to a community. Television producers, writers, directors are part of a community mm -hmm. and so on. And it's that process that intrigues me. I guess the answer to your question mm -hmm. is once I became aware that there was a process there that had very real human community elements to it, I became I became enamored of it, and mm -hmm. I, I guess I just simply changed the direction of my research dramatically. Right. And then you begin to see how storytelling forms community, how it brings people together, mm -hmm. helps people to have a sense of belonging. You begin to see how it's used to pass on the culture. Uh, you pa use the story to tell the next generation what we've learned in That's our correct. experience. That's correct. And the story... 
Uh, and again, to go back to the point I was making before, we then also use the story to disclose something of the deeper dimensions of life, yes. to, to raise up what I like to call the mystery aspect of human existence, something that can't be rationally analyzed and logically deduced. And so there is this, what I call the disclosure power of story. A lot of our philosophers in the 20th century have seen truth that way. Truth mm -hmm. is a matter of disclosure, not so much of logical argumentation. That would be one of the uh, lines of the existentialist Martin Heidegger, for example, that truth has to do with uncovering, with uh, laying bare, with uh, opening up to sight, uh, allowing people to see. So the truth really is seen as disclosure. It's a very different idea from saying you get to truth by logical deduction, yes. and which puts the great emphasis on reason. In this way, there, it is sort of the whole person who arrives at truth. There's an yes. emotional, intellectual component. There's an important imaginative component in it all. And so we can see that what stories do is disclose a truth that maybe you cannot arrive at, and for sure you cannot arrive at, in terms just of philosophy or even theological analysis. That's, I think that's quite true. And also, that you cannot arrive at alone, that you have to do through the interaction with other people. Um, but but this, this linkage is, is, I think, important, too. Linkages um, between ourselves and other people, between ourselves and a community, those linkages are forged through storytelling. That's how that occurs. Um, going back to my Gunsmoke example, because um, it's a personal one, I think, and I want, just wanted to share it, and that is that I had two things in common with my grandfather, two things, which I think are interesting. Baseball, because he, he was a frustrated minor league ball player. Uh, that is, his parents would never sign a contract for him to play minor league baseball because they said it was not pro an appropriate job for a gentleman, which I've always found amusing <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, and so he coached Little League for, for, um, for the rest of his days. Um, but uh, that was one thing I had in common with him, a love of baseball. But the second thing was a love of gun smoke he would never miss an episode of Gunsmoke. And I carried that with me so that even when I was in college and dating and so on, I would organize my Saturday nights around Gunsmoke when it was still mm -hmm. on Saturday nights. And I would never go out on a date until after Gunsmoke, just the way it was, because that was an important part mm -hmm. of my storytelling experience at that point. I didn't understand it rationally. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do and I wanted to enjoy these stories. Um, and then the more research I've done, the more understanding I have of the process, the more I'm convinced that my time was well spent because that connected me. It created linkages mm -hmm. between myself and other people, my grandfather particularly, but other people out there who obviously had concerns that I shared, you know, who, mm -hmm. who had values that I shared and so on. And that process goes on. So disclosure is a nice way of talking about that, disclosing the world to us mm -hmm. through stories. And we learn more about the world that way than we would through scientific tracks or sociological inquiry. Uh, it's not that those are invalid, it's just that those are other ways of knowing. Right, and often those are the ones that are celebrated in the culture and especially in the academic world right. and the other modes of knowing often are looked down upon, which we have to recognize that kind of problem in doing popular culture or eventually in doing theology since there has to be a strong imaginative component in theology. Theology has to be trying to deal with myth and symbol and ritual at the very essence of, of what we are analyzing. We're not analyzing a, a budget sheet or a flow chart. We're analyzing the way ritual works through symbols, the way um, we call those enacted symbols, mm -hmm. and the way it works through myth, which would be the narrative form of symbols. So religion and theology are always concerned with the world of symbol. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is something that always eludes rational analysis. And so our claim is that the symbols light up a portion of reality that uh, remains obscure otherwise. It okay. gets us in touch with it. It communicates some knowledge about it to us. And especially it, can, it communicates some evaluation, some affective feeling about the topic. So, I mean, that might sound all abstract, but for, for Christians it, to go to the Lord's Supper and to uh, participate in that is it to participate in a symbolic action. It is to be involved in ritual. And that yes. ritual, we say, makes present for us Jesus Christ. We don't just tell the stories, but it makes present the risen Christ for us so we can encounter Christ in the community, in the Word, and in the sharing of the sacred meal. Now, I think that the, 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 the theology and popular culture studies have, the, have one thing many things in common, I think, but one primary thing in common, which is the study of signs, the study of things that mean something other than what they are themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that the study of popular culture is really the study of signs, symbols in our society that generate 
uh, an understanding of, of how are we relate, how we are interconnected, how we are linked in some way, fashion, or, or another to each other, and what we value, what we celebrate, what we, what we do collectively, what we do, um, as again, as a community, mm-hmm. the idea of building that sense of community. And uh, I think that's important to keep in mind that, that popular culture, um, the study of popular culture is a study of significant symbols. Um, very, a, a mm-hmm. term used in popular culture studies is iconology. That is, borrowing from the study of Byzantine icons mm-hmm. to the uh, world of secular icons. But secular icons have tremendous theological import in some yes. instances. You know, and, and no that's, doubt that's about often it. missed. And um, the study of, of what, what we call secular symbols all around us um, can carry, uh, if, if you know how to read them, can carry tremendous uh, messages about people's spiritual lives. Let, let's just take an example of the way television brings us something uh, periodically, and that is the Olympic Games and mm-hmm. uh, the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies, whether Summer Olympics or Winter Olympics, in which you have all kind of symbols operating, <coughs> like the flame and the putting uh, lighting of the flame and putting it out, about sharing medals and so on, about unified experience. And television lets us in some way participate in this great myth and this great ritual that uh, surrounds these symbols. And so I think that you would see an example there of where very important human values would be raised up about yes. solidarity, about relating through uh, friendly competition rather than war, of learning how to get along and living in this universe of ours and so on. So there you would see an example, it seems to me, of secular symbols that really function in, in, in almost a religious yes. sense, implicitly religious, because it has to do with what do we ultimately value, what really is important to us. And that's an international perspective. And on a national perspective, I think the Super Bowl functions precisely the same way. I mean, the Super Bowl is a kind of secular religious experience for 70-plus you know, million Americans who tune in every year to see the two, supposedly the two best teams play. Of course, we, uh, we sort of exaggerate it and call it, you know, it's, it's the world, it's the world, uh, football title, mm-hmm. you know, in effect, the best in the world, uh, as we do with baseball. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a competition based on superiority of one over the other, surrounded by symbols from the mythology that we live in, you know, mm-hmm. um, what it is to be a successful person within that society. The what advertising we, brings out a lot of that, doesn't it? it I mean, they does. pay uh, large sums of money for a short segment on the TV, right. and th- there are messages being given about what the good life is, about what success is, about how you uh, make it in this world, and so That's on. And uh, so the Super Bowl becomes this kind of a celebration of corporate America and what corporate America really values. Um, and those values are played out, you know, very dramatically uh, over an extended period of time. The, the Super Bowl is not just, after all, uh, a three-hour broadcast. It, in fact, is uh, a broadcast that covers the whole weekend. They begin mm-hmm. with the pre-Super Bowl festivities, and they build to the game itself. Um, it's also nicely timed. I've often thought that if they hadn't invented it during that period of time, they'd have to create some other holiday because it's a long haul between New Year's Day and Valentine's Day, and we have to have something in something there. Something in there. And the Super Bowl fits it. I must say, Mike, as I think about the symbolization in the Olympic Games and that in the Super Bowl, I have a stronger predisposition towards, towards the, the Olympics. Olympics. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. It seems to me that the symbols that are celebrated there and the messages that uh, symbols point to uh, – uh, accord uh, much uh, better with uh, what I would think of as a fundamental Christian outlook on life, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, than does the Super Bowl. In other words, I would see, as soon as I would start thinking of the Super Bowl and the message is, I would want to add a critiquing element. In other mm-hmm. words, I have to quickly say, well, let's uh, examine the values portrayed there in the light of the gospel as a Christian theologian. Let's uh, see if they accord with the message of Jesus. And very often I would have to say, well, they have to be criticized. And and we don't want to make it sound like uh, that the only way to be happy in life is to put away a certain number of beers or mm-hmm. that the only successful people are those who have... Uh, really made it in the corporate world, et cetera. So, I mean, I think we, we, there has to be a discrimination as we would look at the symbols that are raised up at any point on television. If that's what we're on now, I mean, the idea was to talk about storytelling yeah, right. in films and right. television, so I guess we're on television now, and we're saying, I brought up that, you know, it, it seems to me to do this valuable thing of letting us participate vicariously in 
the Olympic world and the joyous celebration that mm -hmm. comes from the athletic competition and people from around the world and so on. But I, right away, I have to introduce a critiquing kind of element. And I understand. Say, and what uh, symbols, uh, you know, whether they really accord with the gospel or seem to be against mm -hmm. it. I think that's a the legitimate concern, but I think we have to also balance the uh, perspective on the Olympics. The Olympics, after all, are an alternative to war. That was the original concept for yeah. them. But they are very nationalistic and very, very uh, provincial in the sense of its account of how many gold medals one right. country or another is going to And achieve. it seemed to be worse in the past when the Cold War was on and the Soviets and the U.S. were really vying. And then we knew that East Germany was doing this background work and preparing these athletes in ways that maybe we weren't, wouldn't uh, really accept. So there's all kind of critiquing that would need to be done. That, that raises up the general point. No matter what symbols the secular world is raising up for us and celebrating, treasuring that uh, out of a Christian perspective, theological perspective, there has to be a, some way to say, is this good or bad? Is this really furthering the human project right. or not? And that's the advantage of studying popular culture, it seems to me, is that one of the, one of the purposes of it is to develop a kind of critical perspective. And the assumption uh, that some people make that it doesn't deserve analysis is, is just simply wrong. Well, it's wrong because it's so powerful and all pervasive that you make a mistake immediately because you're not looking at something that's forming people's consciousness, Precisely. that's really dictating behavior very often. Mm -hmm. Mike, where else do you want to go with this television question? Because I took it on a very narrow track. Well, I think one of, the, one of the ways of looking at television is, is as a medium which, uh, which is a kind of, some people refer to it as electronic hearth. Um, you know, it's the storytelling process for a large number of people. It's not, it's not that we don't still tell each other stories in the oral tradition. We do. Um, tell them in our families. We tell them in our families. We tell them among our friends. We're a very yeah. oral culture. Um, and, and those of us who have teenage children know how oral they are when they are on the telephone all the time. Mm -hmm. But we, we do live in a world that tells stories at coffee breaks, uh, after work, uh, before work, uh, at work. Uh, but we also rely on communal storytelling processes. I would suggest that things like television are the glue that holds the society together. It's the cultural glue that, sh that provides a kind of a window to the values that society has. Now, you may or may not like the values as a whole, but I would argue on, on, on the average, they tend to be more positive than negative values out there. They're about friendship. They're about family. They're about uh, being, uh, being committed, being... Uh, you know, being involved in your community and so on. So I think, by and large, they tend to be positive. Television is then a storytelling process. It's a way in which we tell each other stories that the society has deemed important at that particular time. Mike, you know let, let, how about some examples sure. here? Can you pick out particular television programs that perform this function well, as I, you see it? I think uh, there have been a spate of made-for-television programs that have dealt, for example, with spousal abuse or child abuse. That's in recent years. Um, but I, uh, I, I uh, would hesitate to mention it because it's a controversial show, but I think The Simpsons, um, you know, as an animated cartoon show, a kind of uh, contemporary family situation comedy that's well written, uh, deals with some pretty interesting relationships between children and adults, between adults and the world they live in and values that they have. It does it in a very exaggerated fashion. Um, it has magical moments, I think, in it. But I think The Simpsons can be viewed as a critique in effect of contemporary values. That's Again, you have to stay with the show. You have to watch it week after week to, to, to totally appreciate that. But I Haven't you told me in the past about certain episodes <laughs> when you, you saw, you know, really deep questions being suddenly explored well, and I, so I, on? I think there are some remarkable episodes in there. Uh, one, for example, where um, uh, Homer Simpson decides to try to cheat the cable company, and so he sets this whole elaborate process in motion and then relents finally because his wife and children convince him that's wrong, that's immoral. You know, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that process was interesting. Another example is when Bart Simpson, who I think a lot of people shudder at because they don't want their children to behave like Bart Simpson, but uh, he, he, uh, there's an episode where he isn't prepared for an exam, and so he prays to God that if God sends snow, that, that he will dedicate himself to study the next day. And so the snow comes, um, and he forgets all about his dedication. He gets his sled. He's going out the door, and his sister stops him and said, You promised God that you would study today. And she launches into this metaphysical uh, discussion about commitment. I mean, it's unbelievable in the middle mm -hmm. of the show. And then he decides, no, he must live up to his responsibility. So he goes off and studies for the day instead of sledding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a magical moment. Now, some people would argue these are rare, uh -huh. you know, that I'm, I'm too selective and that, that the majority of television doesn't, doesn't function. I can tell you, someone who supports that, your friend, Father Andrew Greeley, who uh, often praises your work, mm -hmm. uh, says that... Uh, 
the Cosby Show is a good example of this. He yes. says you could learn more about how human relationships, how to deal with conflict situations in watching this show, and that uh, there would be a lot that the younger generation could learn uh, by seeing how they interact with one another and how they come to some sort of conclusion without resort to violence, which happens so often, I guess, on television. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's another example that people would know and that you could comment on. I think it's a good example. I think that um, I think that in the case of The Cosby Show, it's popular for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that you have their parents who are deeply concerned about their children and respect their children, but also know that they have to have a kind of a tough love. You know, there are certain things they have to do to enforce the law, in a sense, so that their children will grow up properly. And they do some interesting, um, I think, uh, they develop some interesting interactions. Uh, I think that uh, The Golden Girls is a very interesting show. Um, I'm not always as, as uh, at ease with some of their double entendres and, and some of their, their, their more risque remarks, but I do like the basic structure of the show, which shows the importance of friendship when you're growing old and the idea that people interact. The vast majority of situation comedies on television are about interpersonal relationships and about the value of friendship and family and, again, uh, your selfless concern about others and how that, in effect, is a good way to live and how you should be uh, attending to other people's needs and how even at work you can develop a kind of, um, a kind of camaraderie. There's uh, a storytelling element in that in the Golden Girls also, is there not? Yes, there's this wonderful, s very often uh, the grandmother, uh, well, the mother, Dorothy's mother on the program, um, the elderly woman, uh, simply stops the action by saying, picture this, Sicily, 1921, and launches into this family narrative about what it's all, you know, what, what we're concerned about there at that particular <laughs> picture moment. Picture this. Picture this. Is. And so she begins to tell stories, mm -hmm. um, and stories are woven into that process. I, I like that idea of a picture this because it says something about what stories, uh, how they operate, doesn't it? Because yes. it's imaginative vehicle. You have to picture, you have to get into it, you have to be able to see what's going on. Stories work through symbols through images, right. and, and uh, I suppose the more universal character they have, or uh, maybe, more, maybe better put, the more particular they are, like happen in this place at this time, the better chance they have of saying something universal. That's correct. Of, of, uh, we like to say it in theological circles that the finite reveals the infinite, and that if you can probe more deeply into the finite, the particular, the actual historical event, the actual experience, that that is how you will find God, not by abstracting from that or looking upward, but by looking at the experience more deeply because there is a depth dimension in that experience that it really is the God present to us. I think that's, uh, you know, I think that certainly is an important point that, that we, we live through particular examples, particular people. Um, when, when, you, when you ask me about the tele storytelling process, uh, as a child, one of my um, fondest memories is a program that some of your listeners may remember, some may not, but I was affected by it called I Remember Mama, which was one of the earliest family situation programs that was dramatic. It was not a comedy. Uh, it was a serious program about um, uh, Norwegian immigrants to San Francisco at the turn of the century, and it takes place there. But it always begins with this, this, this girl, the, the daughter, uh, opening this book of family memories and saying, I remember Mama, and then she recreates the stories of their life together. Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, Little House on the Prairie, a series of stories you know, based on historical accounts, um, uh, but but fictionalized, obviously, and Michael Landon's legacy is, is in effect, in Little House on the Prairie, the story of America growing up. Uh, wonderful episodes in there. Episode in there, for example, where um, the telephone comes to Walnut Grove and how people react to it, you know, the way in which people uh, have a difficult time adjusting to a new technology like a telephone. Finally, one of the characters rips out the telephone lines and says, I'm not having this damn thing interfere with my life, you know. A uh, 19th century version of the um, supersonic transport protest, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> in effect, saying that technology is not necessarily mm -hmm. good. So these are storytelling forms that bind us together, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and people... Yeah, I want to I want to turn to the question of the of the audience, the people watching television. So we got these people scattered all over the country in mm -hmm. their living rooms and maybe half distracted and other things going on and half watching and so on. Tell me, I mean, how 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 is this binding us together? Well, or? I think a good example of it would be in the Gulf War. Um, the American public could not get enough coverage of the Gulf War. The Gulf War was their story that they've been waiting to have told for twenty plus years. Um, you know, the disillusionment over Vietnam 
was lingering in the culture in a very dramatic way. And television entered into the coverage of the Gulf War with a vengeance. And I think what we had was the retelling of the, of, of the Vietnam conflict with a, this time with a positive end. You know, mm -hmm. And um, in, in effect, I would argue that and the Gulf... That's your sense of why, or one of the reasons why the gr tremendous interest in it. Exactly. People couldn't, couldn't come unglued from their television set. I mean, the, the reason that CNN was catapulted into international fame was because it was, it was the best story storyteller on mm -hmm. the scene. It had the stories ready to go and it was able to convey the stories in a, in a very, uh, with verisimilitude. You know, they're, they're right there in, you know, in the middle of the war effort, re reporting on the war, giving you the information, and this time with a positive end. You know, we're under, it's under control and we're going to defeat the villains and, he, and here's the positive result, you know. So w it's, it's a very powerful storytelling process going on there right. through news. Yes, and, and the medium is, is so pervasive and so it makes me think that the, that the churches, apart from the televangelists, have not learned to use this medium very well. We really can't go into that in any detail, but... Uh, I'm, I'm afraid it, that's but true. It, it, yeah. Don't you agree with oh, that? Absolutely. The churches have not figured out yet the power of the medium, nor have they figured out how to use it. People should have listened to uh, Fulton J. Sheen. He knew how to use television, and then somehow that lesson was forgotten. Mm -hmm. you know, it just didn't happen beyond Fulton J. Sheen. So I think you're excellent point. Uh -huh. Excellent point. But, and it also highlights once more the point that you're making, that the storytelling related to this old television world is uh, something that we have to analyze because it's influencing us. We have to look at it okay. and carefully. And so from a theological perspective, I want to do that in a critical sense and say, are the messages valuable that we're receiving? Uh, do they need yes. to be criticized? Do we need are there other aspects of the culture that don't get brought out? Do we... Do we really get women's experience properly portrayed? Do, is there too much violence and all of those things that go along with the more positive things that, that we might try to uh, say in all of this? So, Mike, uh, as always, you bring a fresh perspective to it, and I love it. Storytelling, uh, we were going to do films, but we stayed with television, and that's good. And uh, that helps me see it in a, in a clearer fashion, and I think relates to the world of theology as well.